Convergent evolution is a hell of a drug. It morphs and changes, forces, stretches, and squashes organisms to fit a specific kind of niche. It bridges the gaps of time and genetics to mold critters into similar shapes, providing a near-perfect example of eternal recurrence. I'll leave the explanations of most of these to their own video or series, but one particular little shark got a jump on the whole swordfish shtick well before our modern saw sharks and saw fishes. Meet the eternally boopable Bandringa. Happy Shark Week everyone! Hope this video finds you well and that it comes out on a designated week. Yes, I'm clout chasing by riding Discovery's trend. Don't blame me, blame the game. Love ya. Modern sharks are made up of two major groups, the superorders Salachomorpha and Rajomorphii. The Salachomorpha are sharks, as everyone knows them. The Rajomorphii are rays and skates. These guys belong to the uber-thick Eusalachii infra-class. I bring this up because there's another order of shark-like critters within this group that were super cool but are now extinct, the Tenacanthiformes. The Tenacanthiformes were torpedo-shaped cartilaginous friends with teeth shaped like multi-tined tridents. Some even had spines on their fins. I brought these friend-shaped sharks up in my Fossil Fish Week video that also brought up JP Hotnet. Keep your eyes on this space in August for more stuff from that video. As traditionally shark-shaped as most of this group is, they were around for so long that some groups adapted to different ecologies, which forced their anatomies to change along with it. One of the strangest was Bandringa, and its story takes us all the way back to the summer of 1967. How some guy found a shark. During the hot, muggy summer days of 1967 Illinois, Ray Bandringa collected an ironstone concretion from a strip mine dump in the coal mining area of South Wilmington. That concretion contained the amazingly preserved remains of a young shark sporting a long, paddle-shaped bill. Special consideration should be given to Mr. Bandringa as he recognized the scientific significance of his find and brought it directly to the Field Museum of Natural History for study. This was all the way back in 1967, too, and that's pretty cool in my book. More people should be like Bandringa. Be like Bandringa. Before I move on, a concretion is a hard, compact mass of minerals that are formed when some minerals precipitate or sink down into the cement or connective material in spaces between particles, which are usually sands, gravels, or conglomerates. They usually occur in round shapes, form after sediment has been laid down, and form before the sediment has hardened into rock. These outer rinds of hard minerals usually also form around a nucleus that could be anything from a chunk of rock to a piece of animal or plant. The particular concretion Mr. Bandringa found was made of ironstone. Ironstone is basically a bunch of rust and sediment hardened together into a rock. They can form directly from deposition or as a chemical process. Bandringa's shark capturing ironstone concretion was formed through chemical replacement wherein bacterial decomposition ate the body and crapped out some carbon dioxide that mixed beautifully with iron that had been dissolved in the groundwater. This created siderite, which is a specific mineral that occurs in ironstone. The siderite crystals formed detailed casts of the critter's soft tissue structures. Since the critter inside the nodule was a shark, there were no bones for it to preserve. So what was left was a film of material that shows good outlines of the soft tissues. This isn't a one-off either. There are a ton of fossils preserved in this exact same way throughout the layer of rock of origin which is called the Francis Creek Shale. This shale layer dates to the Upper Carboniferous period and represents what would have been a tropical delta environment with lots of rivers flowing all over the place. The type locality of this layer, or the place where it was first recorded, was the Mason River or Mason Creek. So the places where the fossils are found are called the Mason Creek Fossil Beds. One of the more famous specimens found from this layer is the continuously mysterious Tully Monstrum. 
So, what was preserved in Bandringa's nodule was a small shark with two pectoral fins, pelvic fins, anal fins, caudal fin, two dorsal fins with fin spines, two big, dark spots that were once its huge eyeballs, and a long, thin, paddle-shaped extension of the animal's snout or rostrum. Meckel's cartilage is the name given to the chunk of cartilage that makes up a shark's lower jaw. The Meckel's cartilage in the fossil shark was of average length, forcing its mouth into a downward position. In honor of the guy who found the specimen and turned it into the museum, then chief curator of the Department of Geology, Rainer Zangirl, named the beast Bandringa Rei. As far as Zangirl could figure, the shark was a tenacanthiform. The teeth shape is a good giveaway as to whether or not it's a tenacanthiform, since they have cladodont teeth, or multi-cusped teeth, used for holding onto and capturing prey, rather than slicing, dicing, or pulverizing. The holotype specimen is two halves of a concretion, with both sides showing different amounts of soft tissue. Zangirl characterized the specimen as a young individual due to its enlarged head, weak dentition, lack of dermal denticles, and lack of calcified cartilage skeleton. The near-perfect preservation of the overall specimen suggests that at least some indication of the critter's cartilage skeleton should be preserved as well, but it's missing. It was also missing any indication of dermal denticles, or the dentine-covered scales that cover cartilaginous fish skin. This could be because it was a smooth-skinned genus, but it coincides with other pieces of evidence that suggests it's a juvenile. Zangirl extrapolated on the growth of Bandringa, based on the goblin shark's known growth stages. I find this highly dubious due to how distantly related the two are, but it seems it was a comparison more in body form and function rather than true evolutionary relationships. On top of that, he made sure to note in his paper that it was partially speculative and that his hypothesis was likely incorrect. Zangirl then went on to blather about how similar the fins are between Bandringa and the living goblin sharks and the extinct close relative Scapanorhynchus. Because of these similarities, Zangirl, that wily scoundrel, figured Bandringa was a deep sea marine piscivorous predator. Ten years later, a second species would be named by Zangirl from more Mason Creek specimens based on the presence of cartilaginous skeletal elements, rostrum length, distance between the dorsal fin spines, and the preservation of the dermal denticles or scales. He called it Bandringa herdinae. This was the opposite of the preservational details of the first specimen. A 2014 paper by Lauren Salin and Michael Coates discussed how the differences between the two Bandringa species were more due to taphonomic biases than actual evolutionary differentiation. What that mouthful meant is that the environment that preserved the second species was different and in a different location than the one that preserved the first specimens. There really isn't enough evidence that the two are distinct, since one location apparently didn't preserve the skeleton or scales, while the other did. One of those environments was freshwater, while the other was marine, which muddies the water even more. The newer 2014 paper basically acted as a monograph and redescription of the known remains of Bandringa, which number beyond a dozen. Salin and Coates found that Zangirl's assessment of Bandringa as part of the Tenacanth group to be a little bit dubious, and proposed that the Tenacanth group shouldn't be considered a natural grouping, but more of a grade of unrelated animals. The Tenacanth label describes the cladodont teeth, dorsal fin spines, and a unique cleaver-shaped palatoquadrate bone in the skull, but some sharks traditionally called Tenacanths don't have these features, while some have a mix. The traditional tenacanth features would therefore arise convergently from a similar source. Bandringa is one of the sharks that has some, but not all, tenacanth features, making it difficult to place in its tree of life. Salin and Coates put it in the Elasmobranchii group without any specific classification, making it an inserte cetus or uncertain placement. The locations where the different specimens of Bandringa originate are home to vastly different taphonomies, or how things become preserved in the fossil record. You already know of the Mason Creek beds, but those beds are divided based on the environments that formed them. One assemblage is the Braidwood biota. That's where the first specimen was found, and where most Bandringa fossils are of juveniles that lack a skeleton, hard scales, and have big, cute heads and eyes. This assemblage is composed of freshwater deposits, and its nodules are reddish color. 
Specimens from this assemblage are preserved mostly as impressions and sometimes with minimal phosphatized cartilage remains. The second assemblage of the Mason Creek is called the Essex biota, where the nodules form in tan and yellow colors. Most of the Essex fossils are preserved where they fell after death, or in situ as the nerds say, while the braidwood stuff shows evidence of transportation seaward after death. The sharks preserved here are smooshed into two-dimensional pigmented outlines and traces. Skeletal bits are only vague traces. A shark wrench is sort of thrown into the mix with additional locations where Bandringa fossils are found. One of these is Five Points, Ohio, and the other is Canelton, Pennsylvania. These two locations are about 750 kilometers away from the Mason Creek stuff and are 22 kilometers away from one another. And yet, they are the same riverine system as that which you'd find at Mason Creek. Eternal recurrence, we meet again. Specimens coming out of these locations are only preserved as imprints of the cartilage skeleton, scales, and teeth. The differences between how and what is preserved in these shark fossils are shared by other organisms preserved in these deposits. Hard parts like shells, cartilages, bones, and exoskeletons don't preserve in the Essex assemblage, despite exceptional preservation of soft and squishy creatures, as well as the soft and squishy bits of critters with hard parts. Hard parts like teeth, scales, eggs, leaves, insects, and shells are found in the braidwood assemblage, and soft parts are hard to find. This all comes down to the nitty gritty of the environment where the animals die and become buried. The preservation type seen in the Essex biota typically occurs due to strong acid concentration in the water. Low pH tends to phosphatize soft tissues and preserves them but eats away bone and other hard parts. The opposite is true of high pH, braidwood, Hanelton, and Five Points assemblages as a consequence of being fresh water sources would have had moderate pH, allowing bone to stick around long enough to impress itself into the sediment. I think all this talk about taphonomy, ecology, and the fossil record is super neat and really cool stuff, but like, I bet you're wondering where I'm going with this. The fickleness of the fossil record in general, and as reflected by the moodiness of the Mason Creek stuff, is a perfect example as to why scientists cannot be quick to tally up all the characteristics they immediately observe in a fossil as definite characteristics that differentiate their fossil from all others. Some of those characteristics might just be a result of the fossil record being an ass. This is a rather roundabout way to explain why the authors of the 2014 paper on Bandringa were saying that it isn't so easy to place the shark among the Tenacanthiformes order. It helps give us dum-dums a framework to compare and contrast with other fossil sites from the same time as the Mason Creek stuff. Plenty of Carboniferous aged sites nearby and even further away from Mason Creek show some similarities in how fossils are preserved. It all helps us understand the environmental systems going on at the time, and how they change. It also happens to explain why they decided both Bandringa species were actually one. It also also explains what the young Bandringa were doing in the Braidwood biota, but not in the Essex biota. Against all intuition, there are plenty of fishy friends who make great parents. Plenty of sharks among those fishies too. Living sharks, rays, skates, and some hollow cephalins even use dedicated areas to squish out some youngins so they remain protected while they mature. These nurseries are almost exclusively inhabited by egg cases, hatchlings, and juveniles for most of the year. It seems like the entire Mason Creek area acted as a nursery for the Bandringa sharks. No adult Bandringa are found in Mason Creek. Adult specimens are only found in the Ohio and Pennsylvania deposits. Taphonomic bias has been ruled out. By that I mean it's not a matter of the fossil record only preserving juveniles in one area and adults in another. Juveniles lived in only one area. This is proven by the presence of xenocanth material in similar nodules in Mason Creek. Xenocanths were another group of sharks that had cartilage and teeth and therefore would be subject to the same pressures of fossilization as adult Bandringa. Plenty of egg case impressions and fossils have been found in the Mason Creek nodules. Some might be referable to Bandringa and some to other more marine sharks, but the point is that eggs are found in an area considered to be a nursery and not in the other places. 
It's possible this area served as a nursery for many different groups of sharks with egg-bearing and live-bearing species all birthing in the same place. This would make Mason Creek the oldest known shark nursery. Fish Eat Fish World Zangirl figured Bandringa was like the modern goblin sharks due to its superficial similarities in the long snoot, low, stretched out tail fin, and similar angle to the mouth. This meant Bandringa would have been a rhynchobathic predator, which is a niche wherein the animal is free swimming and prowls around for fish. There were fossils found in marine deposits after all. What slaps Zangirl's hypothesis in the face is the fact that Bandringa fossils are found from marine to freshwater habitats. Another slap comes in the evidence against a rhynchobathic lifestyle. You see, Bandringa has a super long asymmetrical tail, a super long paddle-shaped bill, eyes positioned up and out, a back covered in thorny scales, a smooth belly, a mouth pointed downwards and forward, and some possibility of suction feeding. All of these are heavily indicative of a bottom-dwelling or benthic lifestyle. Most living rays, sawfish, skates, saw sharks, paddlefish, and the extinct saw skates have these characteristics to aid them in such a benthic lifestyle. Under this lifestyle, the Bandringa were probably adept at sensing the electrical signatures of other organisms through the muck of the dirty swampy water and through the sediment of the river bottoms. They likely had their paddle nose for electroreception like in paddlefish and sawfish, and would launch their jaws out to nab any unsuspecting crayfish, shrimps, horseshoe crabs, and ostracods. They grew large enough to take on the endlessly mystifying Tully Monstrum, whose carcasses have been pulled from the same reddish concretions. In the Essex, Bandringa could have run into jellyfish, sea worms, snails, saltwater clams, shrimp, sea scorpions, cephalopods, and other fish. The braidwood presented Bandringa with insects, millipedes, centipedes, scorpions, and spiders who fell into the water. Amphibians and fish would have kept it company. This was the time of giant insects and crocodile mimicking amphibians after all. What more can be said about Bandringa? The young were pretty small. The first specimen Zangirl described measured in at about 4.33 inches or 11 centimeters. An estimated adult size does not much exceed 28 inches or 70 centimeters. Uh, that's about everything, I think. Hope you thought these sharks were as cool as I did. I had fun learning about them, so I hope you did as well. What do you think about the Bandringa sharks? Let me know in the comments section below, and thanks for watching. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.